Hey, Chris, Ned, Dean, how are you guys? Hey, you doing all okay. right? Thanks. Great. Yeah, for, for 2020 baseline. Uh, you know, good. Good. We're quite dispersed, right? We have two in Boston, one in Ohio, and one in sunny Portland, Oregon. Yeah, no, what's what's the center of gravity there? It's gotta be it's gotta be like Pennsylvania, right? Like like if you were to balance all four of those points on on like a like a bar. It's it's Pennsylvania. It's like Erie, Pennsylvania. Yeah, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Lebanon, Pennsylvania. Bam, there we go. So as you guys can see, I have the first addition to my studio. I don't think our producer is going to let me keep it, but it's a lovely modern retro chic lamp. I I wish that our audience could see that lamp, uh, but it's it's beautiful. Let oh, me let me see the lamp. They cannot see the lamp. It's it's pretty rough. Uh, I got to say, you're missing out. Like as far as lamps go, I'd put this like top ten lamps in North America. Definitely top 10 in Akron, Ohio. That's for sure. <laughs> oh, my so goodness. How's everyone feeling with uh, the back to school stuff while we're waiting for folks to join on the live feed? Well, the big back to school crush crushed the trucking market, as you know. Yeah. Right. Everyone's just on the edge of their seats waiting for back to school. Yeah. It's, I know what are you seeing at MIT, Chris? We, I mean, you um, have a kind of a different experience with school than all of us at the moment. We're back. It's it's quarantine week. So semester started this Tuesday, uh, but everyone's doing it virtual for this week. We start in-class physical classes next week. So most 85% um, of all MIT classes are being taught on Zoom, but 15% are being taught either mixed or all on campus. So it's, uh, it's interesting. A lot of COVID testing. And Dean, you have a son, right? In, in Son or daughter in college? Uh, son, yeah, he's just uh, went back last week, but he's had five tests since then. He's in a bubble, within a bubble, just off campus. But uh, one of his, and this is sort of the dilemma parents face, is now we've committed to the uh, food costs and the accommodation costs for the for the year. Um, one of his uh, roommates in the bubble has tested positive last week, but negative this week. So now everyone's in a state of flux and they're not sure what they're doing. But like uh, Chris said, at, at UNH, there's uh, about 75% uh, of classes are online. So that provides some sort of isolation, but a lot of turmoil, a lot of parties going on at night um, as young people do. So we're in a real state of flux right now. Yeah, beer pong is probably mighty difficult in the time of COVID, I would have to imagine. <laughs> did you say, uh, Dean, did you say UNH? Is he in New Hampshire? Correct, University of New Hampshire. Which which campus? Uh, he's at the Paul Business School. Oh, great. Yeah. Both my boys went there. One's just graduated. I'm in, uh, I'm in New Hampshire right now. Yeah. You can probably tell by my background. <laughs> it's awfully green in New Hampshire this Very time. Very green. Right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, Ned, you have a preschooler, so not the full yes. brunt of um, school, right? Yeah, no, I mean, not, not, not as such right yet. Um, it's definitely... Again, we'll we'll see how things develop, but um, the daycare situation has been a little a little dicey around here. Uh, so it's been it's been fun to keep him entertained. But he he loves trains, and we got trains at home, so uh, he's he's doing good. Cool. Yeah, I got a unique experience. We have a kindergartner starting in a week or so, and my wife's an elementary special ed school teacher. So, um, you know. It's going to be wild. So um, I think we've got enough of yours to get started here, um, which it's, it's however many it is, it's that many more than I think I expected at the onset for our first show. So that's good. Um, so this is um, Ask IQ or DAT IQ Live. I'm not sure we really have a name yet, but um, I'm Ken Adamo, Chief of Analytics, and I'm going to let everyone else uh, introduce themselves around the room. Hi, I'm Chris Kaplis. I'm the chief scientist here at DAT Solutions, part of the FMIC Chainalytics acquisition recently. And I'm also up at MIT at the Center for Transportation and Logistics. Ned? Um, I'm Ned. I'm the principal, Ned Damon. I'm the principal data scientist here at DAT. I uh, have been for a while and uh, we do fun stuff here in Portland. Uh, Dean? Yeah, I'm the principal analyst here at DAT. My focus is on uh, freight market analytics, um, supporting Ken and the, the rest of the DAT IQ team. Yeah, so I, I'm sure some of us are familiar, um, just to kind of talk about our other content that we've been producing for a while. Uh, Chris has the Freightvine podcast, which I've been lucky enough, I'm in the illustrious, I'm an alum of yes. that podcast, but a lot of other great content in um, industry leaders. Uh, and then Ned, Dean and I are on 
our weekly IQ market update, which is our pre-recorded show, um, which was really the impetus for this. We've heard from a lot of folks that they'd like a chance to ask us some questions live and um, you know interact with us. So that's why we're doing this. So in that vein, this is our first one. Things could be rocky. Uh, internet connections may drop out. Um, and our producer prepared a little graphic in case that happens. I don't know if she's able to run that now, but um, it's very apropos to the industry that we're in. Maybe. No, nope, no. Nope. All right. Get, get that. That All right. Luxury of live. Um, so while we're waiting for some questions to come in, I wanted to kick us off with what we ultimately didn't get to on our video this week, which is the fundamentals of the frame market. And what I mean by that are kind of tried and true um, mechanisms that have operated for a long time in the freight market um, and how those have changed during COVID. So I wanted to kind of go around the room, maybe start with Chris and, and talk about what is and what isn't holding true through COVID. You know, the fundamentals still apply, right? There's, if you look at any kind of relationship between a shipper, carrier, with or without a broker in the middle, you have different levels of degree of, of a contract, all the way from a spot where it's a transactional for that agreement, that transaction by itself, to dedicated or, you know, you own it yourself. And then in the middle, there's this whole wide range of, of contracts. And what we've seen is all three pieces are still being used. And, and it's just a matter of around the edges. We're seeing a lot of discussion where people are saying it's either spot or contract. And that's really just a stupid debate in my opinion. You need both. They both fit together. And contract is not just one thing. There's a whole continuum. So what I've been seeing over the last three to six months is an extension of what we saw at the peak market 2018, 2017, 2018, is that there's more variety in types of contracts that shippers and carriers and brokers are putting together that are trying to get to where you have flexibility, but some stability of price. But uh, I, I know there's a lot of talk about everything's going spot and you know contracts are dead and you know, long live the contract. Um, but I see it being a portfolio and I'm seeing it continuing to do that. I think shippers and carriers are being more creative in how they use this different flavors on that continuum of those relationships. Um, uh, to use an analogy, do you feel like it's kind of like a bonds versus stocks question where like the, the contract rate is kind of like the bond market where it's, it's more reliable and, and the variance is lower. Whereas, uh, you know, spot is much more of a stock type asset or, or sure. yeah. Sure. But to even add more complexity to that, um, mm -hmm. when we say contract, we all know in truckload and any, anyone who's listening to us knows truckload contracts are a little weird. And if you ex ever explain to an economist, they don't understand it the first time. They're only binding on price, but they're not binding on capacity or volume. So mm -hmm. you have it with a, a, if I'm a shipper, I have a, a contract with a carrier on a lane. It'll say, I'll say maybe 10 loads a week, but if I don't have 10, I don't get penalized. And if I have 15, I expect that carrier to haul them. And on a carrier side, I don't have to accept every load. So that's one form of classic contract that's been around for about 25 years. Um, mm -hmm. But there are other variances to that. There's some guaranteed volume ones. There's some that are index based. So I think um, bonds, yes, and I don't know much finance and for bonds, to be honest. Um, but I think there's, just to say contract and assume one thing, it's mm -hmm. getting a little more interesting now. It's, a, it's a, a range of different types of contracts that we're seeing out there, a lot more experimentation between shippers, carriers, and brokers. I know that when we were trying to model some of the, the contract stuff, something that's uh, kind of struck us is the fact that they're not volume guaranteed. I mean, we've got a lot of folks coming yeah. in from outside the freight market. And um, I think that's one of the things that makes it really interesting, that interplay between the spot rate and the contract rate, because there is that temptation to to sort of play the field when the, the rates start to, to cross. Yeah, um, there's one. We recently did a paper up here at MIT called uh, Goldfish or, or Elephants. And the mm -hmm. question is, are carriers goldfish or are they elephants? And if they're goldfish, if a carrier, if a shipper is really rough on them and doesn't give them business, will they forget about it the next time that the market turns? Or are they elephants right. that remember forever? Mm -hmm. And sadly, it turned out from our analysis that they're goldfish and that they don't really remember. They say they remember, but at the end of the day, they'll still take the business because, mm -hmm. you know, they're they're sellers. They're, they're selling. They kind of take that business. Right. It's a, it's a good question. Um, but we've seen uh, it's it's a it's a challenge to see how that uh, how that's evolving. No, I really need to read that paper because uh, one of the other data scientists here at DAT and I were working on uh, a way to do um, essentially like indexing and trying mm -hmm. to like assess risk of 
uh, people refusing to take volume, carriers refusing to take volume as the spot rate goes up. And a big question about that was the degree to which carriers and shippers had that, that memory of, of being done yeah. dirty. What's interesting, there is a relationship for that. We did a project with a large CPG manufacturer about two years ago that looked mm -hmm. exactly that. We looked at spot premium ratio. So yeah. on that lane, what the, the percentage that spot is above or below contract and looked mm -hmm. at the, the uh, turn down rate. Right. The, and so as you see, as I as my spot premium ratio goes up, my acceptance rate goes goes down. Right. Mm -hmm. and so, but it's not a nice linear function and it's not the same for every carrier or shipper. So it's a little sure. convoluted, but there's definitely a mm -hmm. correlation there. And that's what are I'm you saying talking. out there, Dean? I mean, you're kind of closer to the carrier side around yeah. kind of traditional freight paradigms during COVID. Yeah, a lot of uncertainty. That's the thing that I'm I'm seeing. You know, there's hesitancy to add capacity this time around, even though spot rates are higher than 2018. There's a lot of uncertainty on the consumer confidence side. I mean, just last this week, the conference board said that consumer confidence was down around two, uh, 2014 levels. So oh, wow. co consumers are getting less confident about, you know, the longer it takes for us to recover from this pandemic, um, the less confident they're becoming absent, you know, some sort of stimulus package and PPP. So I'm, I'm seeing this sort of growing fear on the consumer confidence side. And, and the reason oh. I focus on that is, you know, trucking, uh, you know, demand for truckings is derived from a transaction carriers have no control over. It's you and I buying stuff and people building things. So um, I look at what's the demand for things that carriers haul, and that's going to be, I think, the big the big driving force. So now, if you think about uh, where we are right now, from an economic point of view, if you look at home-based data where they look at hours worked, employees working in a number of locations open, they're a time and attendance software firm, all of those metrics are down about 20% still to pre-COVID levels. So even though we're kind of recovering slowly, um, people, are, they're doing more with less people. So I think there's this general fear that uh, there's longer term unemployment possibilities that, and they could, that could translate to lower demand for truckloads. So I kind of focus on the, on the demand side of things and that's what I see as being the most concerning for carriers in terms of adding capacity as they try and forecast what, to, what they're looking at in the next year. Do you think yeah, it's kind of hard to look? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Say it's kind of hard to think further down the road when you're sort of in the midst of these very turbulent times at the moment, right? It's kind of hard to think Q1, Q2, Q3 of next year for long-term right. capital investment. Yeah, you know, I mean, just some of the data that came out this week that we talked about on our video. You know, the uh, the scanning data that uh, IRI capture at the point of sale was fascinating. It showed that you know demand for bacon's up 20% year over year, but shaving creams down 8% year over year. Um, pe people are still buying record volumes of yeast to make bread at home. So th there's all these sorts of things that change during the pandemic. And if you're a refrigerator operator hauling bacon, that's going to impact, you know, your volumes. Likewise, if you're in the bread business, that's going to impact your volumes. So th there's, and, and Chris talked about this in the, in the Pulse report, um, you're seeing lots of uh, inconsistencies across all commodities. And that's what's really disrupting carrier networks. It's leaving this imbalance in, uh, in volume that's really creating the uncertainty. Yeah, and so, yeah, so that, uh, that imbalance is, is something really important, Dean, because I think that's driving a, a couple of different things. Um, the pandemic has hit different companies, different industries, exceedingly differently. If you look at the retail sector, it, it bifurcated, right? And so the essential retailers boomed, not across all their lanes, but generally up 20, 30 or higher for DIY um, stores. And then for non-essentials, they cratered for the first uh, pretty much all of Q2, and they are creeping back up. And the problem is those lanes that, that default and those lanes that exceed, they, they, those effects ripple through for a carrier because they might be building one lane off of another lane's business. If that goes away, going, say, inbound for an automobile manufacturer, now they to make up that other lane, they've got to have uh, bring a truck in from further distance. So you yeah. might be having the same acceptance ratio for a carrier with that shipper, but the carrier has larger empty miles. And so it's harder for them to do it. So they might not surge. So it might be another reason why we're seeing more spot, but contracts are still staying pretty stable. So it's I have, a strange market. Yeah, I have a kind of a, a, a tie on to that. And uh, something that I saw when ELDs were being introduced is effectively like the, the efficiency of, the, of a single carrier being able to, like the number of miles covered went down. And I see this as being kind of a similar sort of an effect where because there's this dislocation, there you get less efficiency on like a per driver or a per equipment basis. Right. And that has these kind of funny effects 
um, throughout the market. Right, right. They have to get the drops up. You're going to handle this lane. You're going to handle it. And if you have to, usually you have a 20 mile deadhead. Now I might have a hundred mile. You're still going to cover it up to the contract. Mm -hmm. You just won't surge as much anymore. Um, but yeah, it's a challenge for the carriers. So that leads us to one of the questions that came in before our broadcast. Um, you know, some, some folks have been seeing things shared around on social media claiming that total contra or total truckload freight volumes are up 50% plus year over year. And I wanted to, with Chris's unique insight with the FMIC data, I wanted to get your perspective on if that's the case. That you're seeing, say that total one freight total truckload freight volumes up fifty percent year over year. No, I just I'm just not seeing that. I think I, if I picked my shippers, I could see that, um, but uh, it, it balances out. Um, and so there is on some lanes. I was just looking at that this morning for the last three months, and it's it's really a, a tale of two cities here. As as I go through and look one one company versus another in the FMIC, um, and you're looking at year over year volumes, some are higher to thirty percent. 40%. I haven't seen any individual shipper that's 50% higher. That, that's a lot. I mean, we're talking about even the uh, the home improvement guys. I mean, they're up a bunch, but they're not. That's a lot. Where we're seeing the bifurcated market thesis, though, right? That, yeah. you know, retail's up, industrial's down. Right? So if the data you're getting is very heavily weighted towards retail, it, it would it would seem to paint that picture. It's just not representing the entire market. Yeah, if I'm in yeah. essential retail or food. Right. Manufacturer. Another point, and Ken, we've talked about this. It's if if you're a manufacturer and you have two channels, whether it's a restaurant channel or an industrial channel, and then a um, retail channel, the packaging is different. And so, if one channel collapses, which happens for restaurants and industrial, no one's going to work anymore. Then that demand is shifting over to the retail, but the packaging is different. So we talked to one um, company, and they said delivering to a restaurant channel. One full truck of product going there is takes 10 in the different packaging, smaller sizes that goes to retail. So you're seeing an increase in volume for number of trucks when the total demand might not be increasing by the same amount. Yeah. Look at beer sales, and they're not up. They're up in a channel, but they're way down in the, in the yeah. restaurant and pub chain. Okay, and I think down, cans up. Yeah. I mean, to, to kind of lay on to that, uh, something that is really difficult, I feel, from the industrial point of view, is that I wouldn't feel comfortable in this market, like retooling production lines, like even though like home consumption is up, uh, retail consumption is up and like industrial consumption is down, mm -hmm. I wouldn't necessarily want to make a big capital investment to, to increase my production on like a, a more industrial channel if that's at all expensive or if that takes a lot of time because nobody knows how long this is going to last. That's fair. Fair. It's, yeah. it, it, the question is, how cheaply can you introduce that flexibility to go right. between? That's that's the challenge. Yeah. So we got a question coming in uh, from Dana Dana Hudson, and um, the the phrasing of it, I'm paraphrasing here a little bit, but. Um, uh, basically, she's asking, uh, there's a lot of new brokers coming into the market, and um, she's interested in trying to understand contract versus spot. And again, like you said, Chris, it's not necessarily a dichotomy, but it's kind of a, a spectrum. But um, why it's very crucial right now, um, given the uncertainty in, in freight and volume uh, in the last period. Uh, Ken, who, who do you think is, is a good person to handle that? Uh, maybe I'll take a swag on the spot market perspective and then turn it over to Chris for the contract. So I was actually reading this. Uh, article or blog post something that earlier this week it was it was kind of funny it was that uh, the whole paradigm of spot and contract is dead right that we're all on a market right now and it's clearly written by someone who doesn't have any idea how transportation works but um you know this is something that we're we're tracking very closely because it's 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 really telling uh, i think this is the second week now that spot is above contract in our indices like nationwide the national average um and that hasn't happened since late 17 early 18. So what we've seen, um, and I'll defer to Chris on contract in a minute, is spot peak in March when we were kind of buying all the toilet paper and canned and goods, stuffing. crash in April whenever we were social distancing and not eating out and not basically leaving our homes. And then it's just been on this tear um, since then, which part of it was seasonality. But then once 4th of July was over and seasonality ended, it still just kept shooting up. So we're now sitting at above 2018 highs but for this time of year, which is something you would not nearly expect. But what's interesting, Chris, is like there's not much movement on the contract market yet. Not yet. And, and anecdotally, we uh, survey our members, uh, about 100 companies, and ask when you've done a transportation event, because like most companies, they usually go once a year for some kind of contract and then maybe mini bids in between. Um, but 
people found uh, up to 5% and about 15% found 5 to 10% savings year over year. Um, now that's a kind of a apples to some orangish kind of comparison. Um, but we're still seeing some rate declines in, in bids. Now, in the last week or so, I've been talking to some other shippers, and they're seeing on certain incumbents are kind of pushing up a little bit on different places. And I'm hearing that a lot of mid-range carriers are not having the capacity uh, for this. So uh, maybe it's getting a little tighter, but I'm not seeing an Armageddon coming in. It's generally contracts are holding up to the approximate commitment they committed to. Um, but the, what we're not seeing is typically carriers would surge 20%, 40% of the committed volume at the contract rate. And that's just not happening right now. So, so is it not, oh, pardon. So, so is it really not worth it to try and like fight to get up the, the routing guide right now? I mean, like normally when you've got this kind of a situation where the spot rate is just so much higher and there is such a demand for um, just trucks to move stuff. To, to an extent at like the, the agreed upon contract price, you would assume that there would be some degree of, of adjustment that you could make to try and like handle that surge capacity at a higher price and sure. get you know, up the routing guide a little bit. I don't yeah, know. So there's a misconception that people do their bid at routing guide and it's like the gospel, right? You don't mm -hmm. change it and you do that. And, and if it fails and you go to spot, um, but every TMS worth its salt right now has a, a waterfall method primary acceptance, even in the worst of times, is 80 to 90%. So 80% still goes under contract. It's that 10 to 20, 25% on certain regions, certain lanes that can cause so much problem. But the majority of those get caught up in the routing guide. And exactly what you're saying, Ned, um, there's a hierarchy, right? As I go deeper mm -hmm. in my routing guide, it, you know, it gets worse, the price goes up, it's a, a nonlinear yeah. function. And then spot just pushes it up even, even higher. So there's a lot of bolstering up of this and that's why a lot of companies are doing mini bids so if i find a primary carrier is failing me then i'll do if i have a monthly mini bid which to me is the best practice to do a short bid it's kind of like sweeping up the cats and dogs that appeared that month do a mini bid lock it into your next annual contract do that every month because then you start throwing things to contract having something in a contract rate just makes it easier to execute it's mm -hmm. an automatic execution because like I said, 80 to 85 to 90% of all transactions go by contract. And right, Chris, I just want to kind of tie into um, the reason why contract rates exist, right? Just kind of mechanically how that works is a lot of the large carriers on that routing guide are asset based or even sure. asset based fleets with forced dispatch. It's not oftentimes the driver in that truck isn't choosing whether or not to take that shipment. They're being dispatched on that. Yes. Right? Not, this isn't like every truck sitting in there is on the spot market. They are, they are mm -hmm. beholden to the carrier that they are employed through. And then and the, and the carrier has a really interesting decision where they do the driver to load assignment. So mm -hmm. I dispatch, you know, I tender the load to JB Hunt. JB Hunt determines which truck, which driver to give it to because they know the hours of service. They know location. They know the driver's preference of where they want to go. And that's a very interesting decision. There's a lot of software to help carriers do that as well. So you're, you're exactly right. A large shipper will tender to a large carrier. Rarely they'll go to the individual owner operator um that's right. that's that's just really complicated and time consuming yeah that's why i was poking a little fun at the market rate thesis because it's just yeah. kind of not how it works <laughs> spot spot is a market rate that is the market yes rate. <laughs> once the, the rounding guide has failed yeah and so you can view it almost like the difference uh, you know it's calculus right as i get tough finer grained the market rate is going to be that instantaneous transaction mm -hmm. as i look for a month contract it's an average right and so it, and they do an annual that's the market rate for over the course of a year so it's just a matter of what your time frame is about what the market is. It's right. always fun to read these kind of things, though, Ken. We chuckle about them. Yeah, I think calculus is a good pivot, Ned. I think we have another question. We do. Uh, I don't think this is quite calculus, but uh, I think it's a really interesting one. It's coming in from uh, Jerry Nelson on LinkedIn. Um, as how consumers buy changes and continues to change, can carriers like FedEx, UPS, and DHL keep up by adding capacity with the already huge imbalance that has driven the large surcharges coming into the fall? Uh, Ken, I, I feel like you have a unique perspective on this. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. I was actually having lunch today with a former uh, co-worker at FedEx who spent a lot of time at Express and corporate. Um, I think you got to buy, you got to split it into like the air capacity, which is just on fire right now. I mean, that's, you're seeing a lot of the, the, the constraint capacity on, 
on intermodal and things like that. There's, you know, it's flying in from overseas, landing in Memphis or Louisville at the world hubs, or, you know, maybe some of the West coast, like Oakland and then getting dispersed. I think you have like this long trend though, of gr- like the inefficiencies of e-commerce on the ground networks, right? Cause that, that, so that would be like FedEx ground, your tried and true UPS, you know, they, their density is the game there, right? Delivery density. And I know during my time at one of those companies, so much thought was put into increasing delivery density, you know, thinking about all the different ways that we can make fewer stops, but yet deliver more packages and parcels. So um, adding air capacity doesn't happen at a rapid pace. I mean, that's usually a well thought out decision to upgrade to a wide body from a narrow body or add a stop. Um, You know, that just, like I said, doesn't happen quickly. And then on the ground side, I, I would suspect both carriers probably have their peak plans in place for the year. They've already talked to their, 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 their leased on carriers and then their flex capacity and they're ready to go. But this is a really great pivot. I want to talk to Dean for a minute because Ari Ash had a great story earlier this week about rail surcharges on the West Coast, especially. So, Dean, can you maybe walk us through the scenario and then how you're seeing that play out, if at all yet, in the trucking market? Uh, yeah, it's quite fascinating. The volumes out of Los Angeles and Ontario, which are kind of the big import export hub on the West Coast, they've been trending upwards in the last week. So out of Ontario, our truckload volumes are up about 10% week over week and rates are up, uh, up you know, close to $3 a mile on that on those major lanes out of there, like to Los Angeles and Dallas. So capacity is already tight on the West Coast. And that's largely because during the post-pandemic, you know, stock uh, replenishment phase, a lot of that inventory came in in June and July. And then it went into warehouse markets and then it's gradually trickled out across the country. So Towards the end of August, we saw this spike in volume, and that's that's sort of carried over into early August. Things quietened down for a few weeks, but now they've picked up again. Now that some more volume starting to come in on the ocean side, so there's already tight capacity on the west coast. Now the surcharge that Ari was talking about in journal of commerce is kind of fascinating because it's it's a surcharge that applies to shippers over and above their contracted seasonal uh, allotment. So it's kind of that surge capacity, and it's it's. It can add at least fifteen hundred dollars to a lane uh, for the fifty-three foot intermodal side. Now, it's uh, Union Pacific were the ones that made the surcharge. They represent less than half of the volume out of the West Coast. BNSF is sort of the other big player out of there. But if you do the math on it right now, um, you, you can you know you're up around three dollars eighty a mile for an intermodal box out of Los Angeles to Chicago. When you look at the rates that are, that UP have put out, truckload capacity is around three dollars a mile. But if you look at, you know, team freight, for example, a team can get that truck to Los Angeles a lot faster than even the quickest train can. So there's this real, you know, dichotomy that's going on right now. You've got uh, the the rail lines uh, tightening up capacity because they don't have a lot of, lot of equipment and boxes to, to move the freight. They're adding surcharges because they can't add capacity to move the intermodal volume. And then shippers are going to be probably forced over to truckload, regardless of the rate, uh, because there's no capacity on the rail line anyway. But right now we're kind of looking at what that inflection point is between $3.80 a mile on the intermodal side and $3 a mile roughly on the road side. But the trade-off is you can get the uh, container there much, much faster than you can on the rail. So that's the situation that's emerging as of last Friday. So we'll be sort of anxiously watching what happens this week as shippers start to look for alternative capacity out of the West Coast. Yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting. I think a lot of that stuff that we're going to be buying over the next few months is going to go through that corridor um, and not having access to intermodal capacity. I mean, what they're effectively saying to small yeah. shippers especially is no thank you. Um, yep. What's yep. the total rate we were saying, like seven to $10,000 to go from L.A. to Chicago? Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's at least $7,000. If you added another $600 for drage, it's up around $7,500, $7,600. And why this is a pretty big deal, Ken, is that about 30% of all intermodal volume runs on that Los Angeles-Chicago lane yep. before it then gets sort of run to other other short-line railroads across the East Coast. So it's a, it's a really important lane to watch. Uh, the more expensive one is going to be to Dallas. I think the r- road rates there are, are pretty competitive right now. Yeah, we're hearing whispers and some unconfirmed reports of some stuff happening in Seattle as well. So it seems like it's kind of be you know, most of the West Coast at this point impacted. Um, I, yeah, I think that that that's actually oh, you said they're essentially saying no to smaller shippers, and I think that that's an important question: is if rates continue to rise the way that they have, do you think at some point there's just going to be shippers withholding uh, 
goods. It's just not going to be economical for them to, uh, there's not going to be a profit in them shipping things that, with the rates the way they are. You know, that's that's an interesting question. Let me put something in because there's very few shippers yeah. at that latitude to make right. that decision. Um, what we're finding, uh, so someone like a, someone who delivers a lot, say a, a beer manufacturer, they can do that because they're sending things to distributors. So they right. will see that market very closely. But mm -hmm. a lot of manufacturers, you're not going to tell, you know, a major retailer, I mean, the spots, it's a little too high. Give me, give me a couple of weeks and then you'll get your back to school stuff. Right. Um, so we, I talked to one shipper uh, manufacturer recently, and they are there's a, something called OTIF, on time, in full. The retailers demand you get a penalty if you don't deliver on time and in full for the whole order. And they're finding that they can't, because the demand's so high, they can't get all the inventory that's ordered fast enough. Mm -hmm. So what they're doing is having to make a decision. Do I want it on time, but only two thirds the load? Or do I wait two days, be take an on time penalty, but it'll be in full? And it's something they're trying to, trade off, but very infrequently does a shipper have the choice of when they get to ship. It's usually a pull from them. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Bettina, have you seen something different? Uh, no, I haven't. I think the, um, the the thing that's driving a lot of the, the need to move freight rather than, uh, to Ned's point, sit uh, longer lead time freight in warehouses is the is the big shift in in retail, in consumer packaging in particular, the pandemic is driven. So a lot of the uh, stock that's coming in is replenishment stock. You know, shippers are, don't have the luxury, I don't think, of just sitting uh, freight in warehouses uh, right now at the start of September because that freight really has to be in warehouses in October ready for the Christmas retail season. So right now I think we're at a point where that freight has to move unless it's something that's where there's already a high level of inventory uh, further inland. We have a question, and I don't know if anybody knows this off the top of their head, coming in from uh, Cambria Broadway. Uh, what is the current spot rate per mile for box trucks during COVID-19? I, I got to confess, I don't know that off the top of my head. I mean, I, I think it, it obviously it varies like where because like lane effects are so huge and uh, like LTL or, or full truckload or, or things. But uh, Dean, do you have like a number or Ken, do you guys have a number off the top of your head? Uh, I'm going to start wildcatting here for a minute. Um, right. So it, de it depends on what it is, right? So if it's a budget truck full of fireworks going to a fireworks display, that this does not apply. <laughs> um, so my previous life I did, I was partly responsible for expedite pricing and a big part of expedite is sprinter vans and 20, 12 to 22 foot box, box trucks. Um, you really can get a great idea of where pricing is headed in that market by kind of just backing off the truckload rates, whether that's 80% of the average full truckload rate or 84%. Um, we always had a lot of luck, at least directionally, understanding where rates were moving um, by by making that calculation. Those were like mainly larger box trucks, not your kind of 12 foot um, moving van type things. But I mean, that's really the best I got. Dean, you might have something better. Uh, no, I don't. I mean, box trucks are kind of out of my league. Um, the only thing I would say is that, you know, I, I work back from running a, an 18 wheeler on an hourly rate of $120 an hour. So something, you know, short of that, I would, I would be probably looking at something like $60 an hour operating costs, but in terms of a rate per mile or a rate per cubic foot, I'm not sure. This is a tangent, but so when I was in my previous job, um, some of these straight trucks, we would call them, were the most ridiculously outfitted, like travertine. So it was really like a, a way for folks who were retired to like see the country we're also getting paid. So these are like some of the most lavishly appointed like travertine tile, um, tile in the bathroom, big screen TV. Um, and they're like, they would haul like 3,500 pounds. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the most wild in, but you know, um, you know, you can subsidize some of your lifestyle, I guess. But they can, part of the reason is they, it's like a, a motorhome on wheels with those expediters because they live in the truck yeah, yeah. Um, a, but but also B because they spend so much time between loads. So even though their rate per mile is high, their total miles aren't all that high. So I think they spend a lot of there's a lot of dwell time, I think, in that space. Does that fit with your experience? Oh yeah. I mean empty was you know, we were running twenty twenty five percent empty. Mm. Um, I'm not speaking for the prior carrier, I think that's more industry. Uh, I thought a lot of husband and wife teams were extremely successful. We saw a lot of unsuccessful teams where you would just take two guys or two gals and put them in a truck like two strangers. Mm -hmm. They would just We'd get calls. They just like so and so took a took took a bus back home. They couldn't deal with the other person. So a lot of like husband wife teams were very successful doing that kind of work. 
Um, but there's a lot of work. I mean, expedited industry is interesting. By all estimates, it's a couple billion dollars worth of um, total annual transaction value supporting the government. Uh, pharmaceuticals require a lot of expedite. Uh, the automakers were a huge expedite and still remain a huge expedite. Um, so, Ken, let me ask you a question. There's two ways to have an expedite, expedited truckload going, say, across the country. One is have teams and they you know, alternate and avoid hours of service. The other is relays, drop and hooks or drop and swaps along like the Pony Express. Did you see much of that? Because I know a lot of shippers do that internally with their private fleet. But I'm curious if, if the large carriers do that. I mean, again, I can't speak. I won't, you know, no. Long and short is no. It was almost all exclusively teams. We would, they would, you know, folks try to do the, I'm just trying to be careful here, but yeah, you can try to do that. But especially when you have uh, a very expensive or very delicate freight and especially the refrigerated stuff, you have to back um, the trucks up, um, you know. No, you just, you just drop. You drop hooks and swap tractors. Well, sometimes these are lashed, right? The trailers can be lashed, or a lot of times that freight, it's straight truck. Um, you can't, obviously. Because oh, okay. um, a lot of that expedite stuff requires truck and trailer tracking. So the trailers are lashed. And, you know, um, but then if not, the trailers can be sealed. Um, and then they do need drop and hooked. And then you need trailer management. You have to have a box for that other receiving truck to pick up to go back on its way. So you're better off just to find teams. Uh, but teams would add anywhere from 25 to 35 percent, right, on top of the yeah. cost. Yeah. Um, and ELDs only exacerbated that. Mm -hmm. They became much, much more valuable after ELDs. Hmm. The other thing I people want... do, Chris, is they'll, they'll do what they call repower loads. So that's that, I think that's what you're referring to when you've got a 53 foot dry van and you've got a, a transit. You know, you might one driver might run out of hours, or you might have a service failure, the truck might break down. They'll literally just repower that load at a truck stop. Yeah. And, uh, and so, keep, it, it yeah, keeps moving. Yeah. I wanted to go back to something that, that we started talking about when we first were talking about the um, the this price for, for box trucks. And that was that when you talk about things nationally, that's very different than, than the local markets. And I remember there was a study that I did looking at like per lane behaviors and per lane structures. And sometimes there's like a real kind of national spirit to things where the national rate kind of filters down to these various markets. And then other times the markets are just so heterogeneous that like you're comparing apples and oranges. And I'm kind of curious about people's uh, experience with that right now, because I'm not, I'm seeing a lot of heterogeneity. I think yeah, Denver is a great example of that. Yeah. I I don't think the national average apply. I mean, the average just there's so much churn mm -hmm. between the different regions that the average national just kind of it's not worth doing much with, to be honest. Yeah, I agree. And and it's still in flux. And this is why I think a lot of shippers are moving to shorter contracts like a mini bid, because the nice thing about a mini bid, if you do a contract now, say just for three months, it doesn't take the same amount of time to run that bid. Right. You just have to tighten up that information and do it quicker because neither the shipper nor the carrier want to necessarily commit for a year anymore right now because things are churning. So if a carrier commits mm -hmm. to the way it is now and then things revert slightly differently, automotive comes back online, then that, it throws them back out of balance again. So I think both parties are saying, let's find a good solution for the now because I'm more confident for three months than I am for six or nine or 12. And then we'll adjust at the end of that. Or they're doing longer contracts with a, a, a negotiation in between to adjust volumes. Uh, but I'm seeing a lot more flexibility because exactly your point, Ned, it is not just one national market. The regions are behaving very differently and they're not consistent. To that point, uh, and that analogy that you used earlier about calculus, uh, I know that you folks at MIT have done a lot of work about uh, indexed prices or indexed contracts. And uh, we've been interested in that here on the DAT side, but we've seen that there's not there's been a lot of kind of reticence to people taking that up as opposed to doing these kind of like, uh, again, to use the calculus analogy, it's like the, the, the method of trapezoids as opposed to like a, a true like derivative following things along. And, and I'm curious about your your point of view on that, if that that's a little abstruse. You, do you, you're playing bingo, methods of trapezoids, you get a point for mentioning that in a- would, would that it were, would that it were. Trapezoids are my favorite my favorite two dimensional shape though. They are great shapes. Um, it, so I, I it's, it's safe to say that we are doing work on index-based contracting. We've gotten a lot of interest from both shippers and carriers because everyone's for it. Um, but the devil's in the details. And in mm -hmm. fact, this fall, um, 3 November, I'll be holding a, a session up here that'll be open 
for most of the public that's really looking at this and trying to understand index-based rates. And prior to me joining DAT in June when uh, Chainalytics was acquired, the FMIC, um, when I talked to shippers, the number one benchmark that people talked about would be the DAT rate. That was kind of the default one that people would go with. Um, but it goes back to our point. Do you want a national? Can we have it? If we, we were just saying that a national index, a national rate really doesn't reflect all the heterogeneity in the different parts of the market. Do we need regional? Do we do it off of individual lanes? So there's a lot of discussion about how do I treat this? Do I treat it like a fuel surcharge and mm -hmm. I adjust it automatically each week? Does it only move in one direction? Because it doesn't, um, when the rates, when the index goes up, and where the index goes down, the carrier's costs don't change. It's just their incentive to default on the contract, right. what really changes. So there's all these things. Should I treat it like an adjustable rate mortgage and adjust every quarter um, and, and for the future quarter? Do I only do it on heavy volume lanes or all the dog or red lanes? And so there's right. a lot of discussion here, and we're trying to figure it out uh, what's the best way to do it. There's a lot of interest in it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we have one more question uh, again from Jerry Nelson. Uh, any insider predictions on the cold uh, on the chain? Sorry, it just scrolled past my view. Uh, on the cold chain of COVID vaccine or the supply of needles, vials, etc., to be ready in November or December. And I think that's a that's a question that that is really going to be interesting. And hey, uh, Chris, didn't you just have someone on Freightvine or upcoming that's talking about healthcare and cold chain? Um, yeah, he, today, uh, Josh Dolan is on there now. It's, uh, it went out last week. Um, but there's, there's another thing for that, um, Operation Warp Speed, which you might have heard about. It's something that is put forth by the government with a large uh, military aspect, um, how to um, the whole supply chain from the development and deployment and distribution of the, uh, of the uh, COVID med medicine when, it, when it's finally developed. And mm -hmm. what they're doing, they partnered up with McKesson. And so McKesson will be doing some of the final distribution, but the military might be doing some of the initial distribution. And uh, the, you hit the two major challenges. One is vials, right? Mm -hmm. That's a major thing. And then also maintaining that cold chain because it's a very cold chain that they have to maintain. I don't know the exact temperature, but it's not reefer. It's a mm -hmm. deep, two to eight, deep. maybe. It's not deep. For, it's not deep frozen. I don't think it's not cry. I don't, I don't know how deep freeze, but it's not. It's not a reefer. Yeah, I think it's two to eight, not the 15 to 20. Sure. But, but yeah, it sounds like these questions are coming from my not so recent past, right? Because I've experienced, we, one of the things we did was a lot of pharmaceuticals. Um, but yeah, I think that's the typical path it'll follow, right? It'll come, they'll probably land from overseas on an airplane, get distributed to like a Cardinal and a Marisource Bergen, uh, uh, McKesson, which will throw the Denver market for a loop, right? Um, and then kind of out to out to where it needs to go. Yeah, so the, the idea is that it's going to go to states and then the states will determine how it's distributed and it'll probably go first to front line. And then there's different discussion. And it becomes very political after yes. that. Point. And so Chris, that's, that's a great, so that's a great point. Do you think it will go through that? So the typical supply chain, right, would be somewhere in Puerto Rico, Europe, wherever it's manufactured, Southeast Asia, it'll land, it'll go to one of the primary distributors and then it'll go out to, Clinic, like that's the flu vaccine, right? That's the typical. Do you think it'll it'll just flood more through that typical supply chain, or do you think new the new paths will be created? New paths, and I think it a lot of it might be manufactured in the U.S. There's, there's, there's debate for that about where it's going to be manufactured. I know there, I I don't know. I'm talking out of my league at this point, but there was discussion about uh, having it coming from different places on the East Coast. All right. A lot of times, cool. the, the pharma moves. After it's already, it's not generic yet, but it's been, this is still kind of going to be cutting edge. And so yeah. we'll see where it comes from. Yeah, for sure. Okay, I'm going to wrap us up. And this is going to sound like a humble brag or marketing thing, but I promise it's not. It's one last question I wanted to squeeze in for Ned because it's going to be something we're going to talk about on our broadcast next week. Um, I ran for just a company update this morning, some rate cast performance metrics, and I was sort of grimacing, waiting for the query to return. I was surprised. Um, uh, we, the model, I think I pulled like a mid-August run for the 14 days for the seven-day rate, whatever it was. Um, error was considerably less than 5%. I mean, it was just a wow. one. So what is it? I don't want to kind of leave the witness, but is it is it one, are you goosing the numbers? And two, um, is it just the almost like the linearity at which rates are climbing that's kind of, the, the models are kind of starting to accept that or just maybe correct me where I went wrong even in asking the question? Um, well, 
I mean, not not to go too deep into. Uh, so so first off, I want to assure you that we're not goosing the numbers. Is that uh, what what you see is what you get? Uh, we switched over to using uh, median absolute error in our reporting uh, out to the customer. So we're trying as well as we can to be really transparent with exactly how well the models are performing and making sure that everybody is on the same page so that n people can can use and can rely on these models and can understand kind of at, at, at a just basic level how accurate and what your your tolerance for error needs to be with, when you use these kinds of models. Um, as far as its ability to, to handle I mean, the, the model suite that we chose, I picked because it's pretty robust. I think that it's still underperforming slightly because, you know, where, where I would like it to be. Um, there are definitely some, some features that I, I really am trying to add in uh, that I have to pass through our, our whole testing process to make sure that we're improving across the suite of lanes and that we're not kind of focusing on performance in some lanes versus others because I think one of the big advantages of Ratecast is the degree and the the uh, fact that the the model suite that we're using works for even very fine granularity lanes but um, because of the models that we've chosen it does if there's a consistent pattern it does pretty well on picking up on it um, even if it is like a non-seasonal pattern. And I think that this kind of like a short, there, there's short-term elements in the model. And I think those short-term elements are what's really making the performance um, where it is right now, which is, you know, good. I'd like it to be better, but uh, I, I think you could say that about a lot of things. Yeah, well, I admire your continuous dedication to improvement and transparency. <laughs> And I think that's right. I think you, the, the, the fact that users can log in and see the rate view rate that we predicted holds us to an absolute standard, right? So um, you, like we've mentioned on prior videos, users can log in and see what the actual paid freight bills were and see how that scored against Ratecast. It's not just a more recent version, you have the same model prediction, right? So, well, hey, with that, I think we covered enough ground and we've um, tempted fate enough for our internet to crash or, <laughs> or things to um, go down. Uh, we really appreciated the questions. I, I want to make this a regular thing. I, you know, we're hearing from folks that um, they want it to, to be a regular thing. Um, feel free to send us in uh, questions throughout the week as you think of them. We have askiq at dat.com. You can just hit one of us up on LinkedIn. I think we were all tagged in the live broadcast. Um, but I think you know we plan to, to do this again next week because we might not have a live sh or a recorded show. Um, and again, we just really like to hear from you guys and almost like compulsively transparent. It's like someone has to be in the background telling us like what we can and can't share because if we could, um, we, would, we, would, we would divulge too much information. But with that, um, I will go around the room uh, with any final thoughts, but I'll just sign off now and say uh, thanks everyone for watching and we hope to talk, talk to you next week. Same thing, thanks everyone. Look forward to talking with you. Yeah, no, th thank everybody. Um, I'm hopeful that, that I'll be able to, to watch my fantasy football team this year uh, and, and lead them to glory, but uh, we live in hope. Dean? Yeah, um, fascinating discussion. I think I'm going to convert my Peterbilt into an expediter with a freezing capacity in the back to hold back seats. <laughs> that seems to be the next growth market. <laughs> if you're looking for a team driver, I don't have my CDL, but I, I, I can play a mean cello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, bye, everyone. We'll see you next All week. Right. Okay. Bye. bye, -bye.